found in our world today that there is no shortage of opinions or platforms for people to express those opinions. Uh, I, I don't usually like to run inside. I'm not so sure I like to run outside, but I like to run inside a little bit less than I like to run outside sometimes. Uh, so when it's cold or, or rainy, I'll hop on the treadmill at the gym and there'll be two news feeds in front of me. And, and you look at the varying difference in the news feed and it's like, are they even reporting the same issue? Uh, just opinions or scrolling through your Twitter feed. Everybody's got an opinion. Your brother-in-law that you're about to have lunch with has an opinion that he's happy to share with you. Even if you have found that your own emotions have all kinds of opinions and, and those can change through the day. And, and, and just like sometimes it's, it's hard to know who to trust. It's hard to know who, who to believe. It's hard to know who to put your faith in. And can I just say once again that in an ever-changing, ever-shifting world, aren't you thankful for the never-changing Word of God? God's Word never changes. It is that rock that we can go to that is above anybody's opinion we go to the Word. And so it's with that kind of attitude that I want to read our, our text for today. It's found in Hebrews 11, 39. Let me set up, set up the, the word that God has for me, for us. And all of these, so the writer is talking about who are all of these, this is the previous generation. Though they were commended for their faith, they did not receive all of what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, the current generation, that apart from us, the current generation, they, the previous generation, should not be made perfect. Aren't you thankful that the promises of God are bigger than any one generation? That God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that it takes all the generations to get all the promises. And just like last week on Dr. Martin Luther King Sunday and that weekend as we celebrated that legacy and that we will always be a multicultural church. Aren't you thankful we're a multi, multi-generational church or multi-generational church? And then, the, and then the writer goes on to say this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the past, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which entangles the present, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, the future. And here's what I know, that the enemy would love to keep you stuck in your past or chained in your present, but you need to know today that God has a future for you. He's got a future for you. In fact, at all of our locations, as they bring up our theme verse for the year, Hebrews 11:39. Come on, locations, don't let somebody else outdo you. You be the loudest, and let's lead the way. Concord, here we go. We are not of those who shrink back, but of those who have faith. And I just want to speak that over somebody's future today. Because here's what I know about the enemy. The enemy's trying to scare you away from your tomorrow and in your tomorrow there is blessing in your tomorrow there is provision in your tomorrow there is break for, breakthrough and so we will not shrink back from our future but we will have faith and that's what I want to impart to you today not just faith in general but faith specifically for your future if you believe that can you say amen so there's an interesting map that's on display in the British Museum of History. It was put together in about 1845, and the, the map is of the North Atlantic uh, coastline. And as you can imagine, at that time, there was a lot, there was some known area, but mostly, mostly it was unknown. And if you look at this map, it's pretty interesting because what the map maker did is he would draw the known area, and then, and then in the, the territory that was unknown, he wrote, he wrote these words. Here be giants. Or in another area, there was another little sea that hadn't, hadn't been explored, and so it was unknown. And he, he would write, here be fiery scorpions. And 
Over off to the southeast, he would write, here be dragons. And this uh, went about until in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Sir John Franklin, and you can see this, you can see what he did with the map. He took one look at the map, he just started crossing those out, and he wrote on the map, here be God. And, and I, lo I love that because to me, that's a picture of what the enemy tries to do with your future. The enemy will try to scare you away from your tomorrows. And he'll say, he'll say, no, 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 don't start that degree. Here be, here be scorpions. No, you don't want to, you've been engaged for 18 years. Don't propose. Here be dragons. I don't know, maybe. Your premarital counseling will sort that out for you. But, but like the enemy will try to scare you away. Like don't, don't, start, don't, don't start that business. Don't, like, don't take that next step. I'm not, I'm not so sure about the future. I don't know about all of this. And even though, see, here's what happens. Even though the past may not be good, it's safe. Because guess what? You control it. You control the past. And people who live in the past are their own God because they control their past. But people of faith step in. I know that didn't go over real well, but you'll get that eventually. And on your way home, I believe that you'll say, amen, pastor was right about that. And, and you can just uh, uh, tweet that to me, amen, pastor. Whenever, you, whenever that hits your spirit today, right? Because let's be, let's be honest, we like what we can control. And even though I don't like what was in my past, at least I know what happened. And I can control the out, and it's, and it's safe. And so the enemy, but the enemy will try to say over your future, here be dragons, here be, here be scorpions. And God wants to fill you with faith to, today that says, no, here be God. Here be in your, I know it's like old English, but you can, you can pray in old English this week. Here be God, here be God. Satan, here be, here be God over my Wednesday. Here be God over that upcoming sales meeting. Here be, here be God, college student, here be God over that new semester. And so I want to, I want to just continue from God's word to impart this faith for the future. You can have faith for your future when you say yes to a better future. I think we've always got to believe, we've always got to have the posture that are, 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 are well, let, let me put it this way. Um, uh, Pastor Ron McManus, who, who was at our church years ago, said it this way. A church starts dying when its memories are greater than its dreams. And that's not only true for a church or a business or any organizational institution. That's true for our lives. See, we have a chronological age, but we also have a spiritual age. And you will start dying spiritually the moment that your spiritual memories are greater than your spiritual dreams. And the Bible says, so our emotions say one thing, but the Bible says, God's word says, since God has provided something, say this out loud together, better. Say that word again. Say better. Remember, uh, those of you who have been around here a while, and I know a lot of you are, are new over the past uh, four years, but um, my predecessor, one of the spiritual fathers in my life, Pastor Rick, that was one of his favorite words. Do you remember that? He'd say, that's one of my favorite. It's not per today. How are you, how are you doing? Better. Better, to have that attitude of better, to have that attitude that God always has something better for me. Some of you have been following a little bit of the news of the Australian wildfires. Have you seen this? A lot of factors gone into this. Um, uh, big time drought in Australia. It's already fire season, but just like all over, all over the nation, really, these, these wildfires have been ravaging not only the, the bush and the countryside, but uh, even making their way close to some of, some of the, the, the highly populated areas and you see the haze and the, the smog and all of that stuff, the, the smoke and stuff over Melbourne and Sydney and, and those areas. And, and you look at that. Here's the, here's the thing about the wildfires is they're, they're out of control, right? It's like, it's like the firefighters can't get a handle on it. They can't get the perimeter. And we've sent firefighters over from the U.S. and other nations have been sending them, but they can't, they can't secure it. They can't, they can't get the perimeter. Have you ever found uh, that you're dealing something with something in your life that's like that? It's like this is like your emotions. They just feel the fear feels out of control. Or, or the, the anger, it just feels out of control, like you can't rein it, rein it in. Or the, the, the child that's going through rebellion, you just can't, like, I can't even, my finances, I feel like I get this bill caught up and I got a, another, another thing over here and I just can't. You ever feel like your life is just kind of, the, you have these areas that are raging and they're out of control. And then once the wildfire th sweeps through that area, you have just these charred remains and this, this desolation. 
And sometimes after wildfires sweep through our lives, the next emotion that we can walk through is it's too far gone. It's too far. The, ma- the marriage is too far gone. Can anything good come out of this? The, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy. I'm going to have to close the business. The child has left home and they don't believe in God. Like what, whatever it is. And, and we're staring at these charred remains. And we can have these then emotions, these emotions of, it is, is it ever not going to hurt? A- am I ever going to trust somebody Again, these charred, I was betrayed, and we're just kind of staring at these charred remains. But here's what's fascinating about these wildfires in Australia is even though it's only been a couple of weeks, here's what they're finding in the midst of raging, out of control, in the midst of desolation. What they're finding is that new growth and new life is already beginning to spring forth out of the thing that looked like it was too far gone. And I love that picture because that's what I see God doing in your life because that's what God does. In Isaiah chapter 61, it says that God is the God who brings beauty out of the ashes. And so can I declare prophetically this picture over your life that that marriage is not too far gone? I see something springing up. I see something springing forth out of your life and out of that situation. See, maybe maybe God had to clear away some junk, some old mindsets, some old attitudes, some old habits, some old stuff. Maybe maybe had to clear out some old relationships so that he can begin to birth the new thing that he is doing. Come on, can you receive that and say amen? God birthed something new in me. Yes, yes to a better future and then yes to your cloud. Yes to your cloud. This is a really interesting verse in scripture. Um, Many have have not grown up in church, and that's awesome. You're actually why we do church is for people that haven't uh, grown up and familiar. The whole reason we do this is for people who have not yet heard about Jesus. Our our whole message is, is about Jesus. But those of you that have grown up in church... You know this verse, right? And so there's a, there's a really familiar verse in our memory, but then you go to apply it, and then it can be like, what does, what does that mean? So Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great, say, say the phrase together, cloud of witnesses, right? Look, therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that memorizes really well in Sunday school, and then you're like, what does that mean? Like, and it can be this weird, like, is this like Lion King where I get a visit from uh, Mufasa? Like what, like what, is, what is this? Is this an ancient? This, like this, no, this is actually, so we don't worship ancestors, right? But this is really interesting. This is biblical. So who are these? What is this cloud of witnesses? It's the people of faith that have gone on before us that are now cheering us on to victory. Like, that's kind of cool, right? Uh, think about this in the terms of, uh, in football terms. So, like, today is one of the greatest football days, right? Football fans, you're all going to gather around for those Pro Bowl parties. No? Uh, nobody's throwing. I mean, come on, the Pro Bowl, right? Like, okay, you probably see more defense in a backyard third grade game than you're going to see this afternoon. It's a throw away. But, but anyway, football, let's go. Uh, not a Seahawks uh, Seattle Seahawks fan, but, but one of the things that I admire about the Seattle Seahawks is other teams do not go into Seattle and win a game. Doesn't happen. It just, I mean, on very rare occasions does a traveling team go into Seattle, and a large part of that is due to the home field advantage. And, and the Seattle fans take pride in this. They're like, I'm in a position or an age, or a weight, or a skill set in my life that I'm not going to be on the field, but I'm still part of the game, and I'm going to root this team on to victory. And so the decibel level is like insane, and they call themselves the 12th man, 11 people on the field at a time, so they're the 12th man. And because of the crowd, 
Because of the cheers, even when the defense is behind, because of the cheers, even when they're exhausted, because of the cheers, even when they feel like they're going to give up, even when they're down by 14, going into the fourth quarter, there's something that happens emotionally and mentally and in your spirit uh, that when you hear the cheers of the cloud that motivates, isn't that cool that you got a cloud? Like you got a cloud, and here's what I know about your cloud. Your cloud is not limited to church on Sunday morning. Somebody say amen. The thing about a cloud is it goes with you. It travels with you. And so when you're at your job, your cloud is cheering you on. When you're in third period English class, you got a cloud cheering you on. That cloud is made up, you got, you got a biblical cloud. So when you're facing a problem this week and a giant that you don't think that you can take down, you got a cloud and David's in your cloud. And David's like, oh, you got this. You got this, child of God. I know because I was there and he was tall and he was armored. But I'm telling you, God hasn't changed. And the same God that took down my Goliath can take down your giant. And when you're walking around a wall and when you finish 21 days of prayer and you are just broken and tired and hungry and you're saying, God, I don't get it. I was here every single morning during 21 days days of prayer and the wall still seems strong the wall doesn't you got Joshua that's saying one more lap around come on you got this don't quit now don't stop praying now you got this I know because I saw it and when you think that you're too insignificant and your past has too many failures and you don't think you have enough resources to do the thing that God called you to do Gideon is saying oh my goodness I got your back because I took out an entire army with only 300 men and 300 on your side with the power of God is greater than he who comes against you church you got a cloud you got a cloud of people that have gone before you you got a biblical cloud but here's what I know you got a personal cloud don't you you got a personal cloud you got a mama or an aunt or a grandmother or a sister or an uncle or some, maybe it wasn't even somebody that was related to you. You had somebody, you had somebody that they brought you to faith. You had a friend and, and they're in heaven now. And they're cheering you on. Isn't that cool? Like you got to, I think of um, Candid and I, after we were married, we, uh, uh, it was a, it was, we walked through a season of loss. And it just felt like punch, 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 like in a, in a fairly short season um, we lost her grandmother, her dad, three of my grandparents, and then my mom. And if I'm not careful, like when I go home for Christmas and, and I've got a, a, a great aunt that's 102 years old, and uh, last year at 101, she was still living on her own, cleaning her own house and everything like that. And the only reason she fell and had a broken bone, she, so she had to, has to recover. And boy, she, like, she is mad that she's out of her house. She is not happy. But... Uh, but, like, I, she had all of these picture books, and so I was just going back through them. And, and, you know, the heritage and the stories and, you know, hearing my dad tell these stories. But here's, here's as, those, are neat, those are neat feelings, right, those, those nostalgia moments. But here's what I know about me. If I'm not careful, I'll, lo I'll allow those memories of the past to call me back. When the Bible says that your cloud is not to call you back into living in your yesterday, it's to build your faith for your tomorrows. That you got a cloud that is cheering you on. I see my, my grandpa uh, Moore, he was, a, he was a bigger guy, and um, it didn't care if I was six or 26. His bear hugs could fix any problem. I don't care what you're going through, one bear hug from Grandpa Moore. And he had one of those smiles that was a disappearing eye smile. And if you'd tell him something, like it didn't matter if you told him that you got that you won the Super Bowl or you got a B in chemistry. Like if it was just a little bit of good news, he'd get both arms going and that those 
went and he just, you know, he just start cheering. Oh, that's so, that's so good. And it's like in those moments, he's in my cloud. Like he hasn't, I haven't lost him. He's just in a different seat in my life and he's cheering me on. And you got a cloud too. Some of you have spouses in that cloud. Some of you have, you've got, you have got a cloud that you can take with you that is cheering you on to victory. And then I know this is a little bit of a stretch. You got a biblical cloud. You got a personal cloud, but you also have an earthly cloud. Or, or at least we all should. Or let me say it this way. We all need an earthly cloud. Because as much as we can draw strength from those who have gone before us, sometimes I need a real voice. Sometimes I need a real hand on my shoulder that says, Doug, your last mile was like a 12-minute mile. Pick up the pace, bud. You got this. Like I, I know, like, I need people around me. I need voices in my life that say, come on. And, and can I just tell you, you're not going to find that cloud on a Sunday morning. You're not. It's too, it's too big, and we don't have the time. Like, like you're going to find the word of God. You're going to find worship. But you know where you find your cloud? You need a tribe. You, you, you need a tribe. I think this past year, I don't lead a tribe. I'm in a tribe. I have a tribe leader. I need that tribe, not just for my physical well-being, but like I'm thinking just back there this past year, moments as a tribe when one person was walking through a difficult situation in their business and, and we would rally around and another person walking through a difficult transition with their future and we would rally around and, and somebody struggling with a health issue and we would rally around like you need, you need that tribe. You know, it is so important to me as, as your pastor that you not only have a place where you're hearing the word and worship and you're finding life and finding freedom, but that you're finding family. We've got like 180 tribes, study tribes, home tribes, uh, uh, the meet at people's home, activity groups, all of these different things and at every location or online. So in our lobby uh, today at Davidson today or cfachurch.com slash groups, we have them in different locations, can I just encourage you to find that cloud because when your kids are acting funky or you get that report from the hospital or when things are going great, you know another thing that's just great to do together is laugh and eat. And sometimes like that is just one of the most spiritual things that you can do together. But we need that cloud to seize our future. And then yes to the next leg of the race. Always yet yes to the next leg of the race. So the writer of Hebrews continues, and let us run the race that is set before us. Can I tell you that this Christian life is not a sprint and it's not even a marathon. It's a relay race. And the goal of a relay race is not just for one generation to run the fastest leg ever. The goal is a successful pass of that baton. And so as a church family, we have to always be intentional. Hey, who? not only how am I running, but who am I passing this to? Are we passing it forward? All it takes is one generation that we fail to pass the baton to and we, we lose. I was reading a publication that uh, somebody gave me this week, and I'd heard this. I'd, I'd never seen it. And, and as, they, as they bring this up, it's called the rise of the nuns. The rise of the nuns. Nuns is a sociological term that they're using to talk about people who, uh, who have no faith. Like there's no, re no religious affiliation to any kind of religion or belief system at all. And so you can look there at the trends among the builder generation, about only 4% would be classified as nuns, and then the boomers at 7%, and then uh, Generation X, my generation. It's about the only positive stat I've ever seen, but thanks for throwing that in there. We, we took it down, a whopping 2%, two per, two percent. but then like if you, like if you look at this, um, I'm just going to tell you, if you look at this and don't see numbers and see people, you'll start, you'll start to weep because these, it's this millennial generation. Do you see the spike that almost 30% of millennials say we have no faith in anything 
No, no, God, the, even the concept of God is completely foreign to my life. And, 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 and heaven forbid as a church that we ever feel like we've arrived. Or we ever feel like what we did in ministry last year or last month is enough. We have to always be intentional about passing the baton forward because these aren't just numbers. These are souls that will either end up in the glorious presence of the Lord or in hell. And this is our leg. This is our leg. We're running our leg, and we got to pass forward. We got to pass forward. This church has had officially four senior pastors in its history. So Pastor Tom and Betty planted the church 61 years ago, and all the people of faith that gathered around them, and they ran, they ran that first leg. And then Pastor Tom was elected to a district uh, uh, official position with the North Carolina Assemblies of God, and so for a season, he passed that baton to his father. And his father ran the next leg. And because Pastor Tom is superhuman in many ways, he came back and he ran a second leg. And so Pastor Tom's father passed it back to Pastor Tom and all of the people that were associated with CFA and that generation, they ran another wonderfully successful leg. And then that generation passed it to Pastor Rick and, and those that were running during that time and an amazing time of, of growth. But now the baton has been passed to us. And can I humbly submit to you today that I think that one of the things that would be one of the most dishonoring things, both to the Lord and to our spiritual fathers, would be to go back and rerun the leg that they just ran. Like, can you imagine that on a track? They gave it everything that they had. They prayed and fasted and preached and believed and worked and it was a generation of world changers and taught Sunday school and, and Royal Rangers and impact and, and were, were uh, in the parking lot and went on missions trip and they, they hand that baton and we take that baton and we go back and do ministry the same way. How dis honoring to their legacy and how dishonoring to our Lord that we would not take that baton and run forward into a new future and reach new souls for Jesus Christ. We got to always be running forward. Yes, to a better future and yes, yes to running the next leg and yes, yes to the divine author who's writing our story. Yes, to the divine author who is writing our story. The writer finishes up this um, thought by saying this. He says, all of this depends on looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus, who is both the author, say author, looking to Jesus, who is both the author and perfecter, say perfecter. So Jesus is the author and the perfecter. He's the author and the perfecter. First of all, he's the author. He's the author. Do you hear that? He's the author. Can I tell this to somebody in the house who needs to hear this today? You're not the author. You're not the author. Have you tried to be the author? I have. Don't look at me all holy like that. Come on, you've all tried. Have you, ever, have you ever said to God, maybe not out loud, but through your actions or through your decisions, hey, I got, I got this. I got the pen. Have you ever tried to write your relationship story and it not turn out so well? Say yes. Have you ever tried to write your educational journey or your, or your parenting journey? I got, I got this, God. I know you got some advice for I know the Bible said, but I got, I got this. Have you ever tried to parent your way? Have you ever tried to do business your way? And, and, and what ends up happening, if you're anything like me, is you've got a wastebasket full of failed attempts of, my goodness, I was in a past relationship, and that didn't work out so well, and, and so that through that 
that there, but I didn't properly heal for that. And now I'm actually in a relationship with a good person, but I got so much baggage from the last relationship that I'm treating the new good person like the old bad person. And I'm trying to write my story. In the, and, and we take, and we just got a, a, a trash can full of, and I couldn't, it's my 14th major in three years in college. And my parents are getting me on, on me. You got to graduate at some point in your life and we're cutting you off and I've got all these things around me and, and we, we feel like we're in this moment where we're just standing in our own failed attempts. Can I tell you some good news? It's okay. You were never meant to be the author. So here's what you need to do. If you'll just humbly say, God, I don't want the pen anymore. I give it to you. You're not, you're not the author. You know what you are? You're the paper. You're the paper. And can you imagine a sheet of paper refusing the pen? But that's what we do sometimes, right? No, I don't, God, I, 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 got, I got this. No, 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 no. Can I tell you that Jesus is the best storyteller of all time? Single adult, he's got your love story. Somebody in here needs to know he's got the next chapter of your adventure. He's got your business story. He's got your family story. He's got your spiritual story. He's got your ministry story. And if you will just be a blank sheet of paper that says, Jesus, yes. Write your story through me. I'm telling you, even if your last chapter had some moments of pain, that's not the end of your story. Jesus is not out of ideas. He's not trying to plagiarize your life after the Instagram life that you want from one of your friends. He's writing an original story through you with your DNA, with your people, because that story, you know what an Instagram story is? You know what they call those? It's called a fairy tale it isn't even real so stop trying to pattern your life after a fairy tale that's about as real as Cinderella when Jesus is trying to show up and write your story through you in a real situation with a real family with real pain points and a real church and real people around you God write my story God be my author and be my perfecter for some of us, for some of us today, we've said yes to Jesus as our author, but he's not our perfecter. And we've put God in a position where we're saying something like this. Jesus, I trust you with my eternal salvation, but I can't trust you with tomorrow. How messed up is that? And God wants to remind somebody that the same God that saved your soul has your future. And you don't need to have doubt and you don't need to have fear because the same God that bled and died for you, if he can get you to heaven, he can get you through Tuesday. Come on, somebody in the house, give him praise because he's got your future. He knows your name. He knows your situation. He knows your family. He's about to release future in this house and in this place. With heads bowed and eyes closed across every location, you would say, Pastor, Pastor, I've trusted him as my author, but the enemy has worked fear in, and there is some area of my future with a relationship, with my kids, with my education, with my, with my, uh, my future, whoever I'm going to marry. The enemy has worked in fear, and today I just need to take my hand off of the quill and submit my life and say, God, I'm a blank sheet of paper. Write your story through me. I will trust you with my future. Come on, if you're in the house and that's you, I want you to stand right now. Right now, God, I trust you. I choose to trust you with my future. Regardless of what the doctor says, regardless of what those messed up pieces of paper around me, I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. I take my hand off the pen. I say yes to tomorrow. I say yes to ministry. I say yes to whatever you want to do through me whatever is holding me back in the name of Jesus God I pray father that you would be the perfecter in the house God, I, I, I pray as much as I am able to, and this isn't about a preacher, it's about the Holy Spirit, but there would be an impartation, not of faith in general, but faith specifically, that there would be an impartation of faith for the future. Whatever decision you're facing, faith for the future.
Whatever relationship you're facing, faith for the future. Whatever challenge you're facing, faith for the future. And now with everybody standing, maybe some with still heads bowed and eyes closed, would say, Pastor, I haven't yet begun that journey of Jesus as my author. And, and I've tried to take control of my life, Pastor, and I, I, I made a mess. But I just need to turn it all over to Jesus. Here's the great news, that all of those past failures can be gone in an instant and that Jesus can begin writing your story fresh and new today. So with heads bowed and eyes closed at every location, watching online, if that's you, when I count to three, would you just slip up your hand? I feel it. I feel it. So this is a new day for somebody, a new chapter, a new novel, a new place in the series. One, two, three. Just slip up your hand. I got gotcha. you. Come on all across the house, watching online. Church family, can we pray this prayer out loud together? Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender to you. Take my sins, take my failures, take my past, and wash them under the blood of Jesus. I invite you today to be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church family. Can we celebrate with those who came to faith today?